are very, very welcome to Grant Thornton's offices this morning for our international tax update for investment funds. For any of you who don't know me, my name's Neve Meenan and I head up financial services in Grant Thornton. Uh, we've run this seminar now for several years and it always proves to be a popular and timely event. Uh, there's something about tax that gets people interested. And it's certainly true that keeping up with changes in international tax, both for the funds and the investors, is a challenge. But it's also a key part of us maintaining Ireland's reputation as a centre for excellence for servicing Irish and offshore funds. And our speakers today bring a wealth of international expertise to us. Um, we start off with Paul Beesey, who makes a welcome return from Grant Thornton in Boston. Paul is a tax partner there who specialises in financial services and also a host of transactions where there is um, any kind of cross-border element. Uh, Paul will be followed by uh, Peter Vale, who's a tax partner here in Grand Sorrent in Dublin. Again, Peter is, uh, has many years' experience in financial services and also in a lot of international transactions and has a range of international clients. And finally, we've Anne Stopford, who's head of uh, funds tax in Grand Sorrent in London. Anne is a member of the AIMA Tax Committee and is also a regular visitor here uh, in Dublin. She has a wide client range, both of funds and of investment managers. And all of our speakers today are very experienced in providing tax advisory and compliance services to funds that are administered here. Um, given the, uh, the popularity of the US and the UK, for funds with, with the fund managers being resident there. We find that working very closely with our associates there is a key part of our work here. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us this morning. Um, Paul BC, a partner with Grant Thornton in the United States. Um, thank you for being here and I also want to, as always, thank our, our colleagues, Grant Thornton Ireland, for, for hosting the event and for um, inviting us to be here. Um, when I landed earlier this week, I found out, like right after I landed, that due to increased tensions between Iran and the United States, the U.S. State Department issued a travel advisory for all Americans abroad. So if anybody asks, I'm Canadian. Uh, so let's talk about the past year and how things have gone. Um, it's been a fairly quiet 12 months uh, on the tax legislative front in the United States. I think there's a, a, probably a couple of reasons for that, and I've listed some of them up there. Um, there hasn't been a lot of significant legislation. A couple of things that the 2010 elections uh, if you recall when uh, the 2008 elections came about and uh, President Obama was elected, the Democrats swept into not only the White House but the House of Representatives and the Senate and pretty much ran the show for uh, the first two years. In 2010, the Republicans pulled back uh, victories in the House of Representatives and now control that. So basically, um, the source of all legislation, when, when you look at how legislation is created in the United States, it starts with bills that are introduced into the House of Representatives. Well, that's now in the hands of Obama's opposition. So as you can imagine, they're not too keen to progress any of the tax legislation that he would be in favor of or that the Democrats that control the Senate would be in favor of. Um, the economy continues to be fairly weak. Um, that's not a surprise anywhere. So anything that uh, has come up with regards to tax legislation in the US um, has really been rebuffed uh, under the view that we really don't want to do much right now that could disrupt whatever weak signs of life there are in the economy by raising taxes or shifting tax incentives. Uh, the debt ceiling debate was out there for the longest time. Um, that's had the unfortunate consequence, I think, of lumping a lot of tax legislation issues in with the debt ceiling so that people aren't focused on the two things. They're kind of lumping it together. And until they can figure out the debt ceiling, they don't want to do much on the tax side. That doesn't always make the most sense. They're not always connected. There's a lot of things that could be done on the tax side and or the debt sailing side um, without necessarily crossing the bridge. But unfortunately, as I said, I think everything's been kind of lumped together. Um, and I know my colleagues in our Washington National Tax Office, Mel Schwartz, who monitors all our legislative tax matters, is, is of the same view. There's too much lumping together there. Um, we did end up having our, our debt downgraded by S&P. Um, which I know a lot of people have looked at and said, aren't they the same people who said all those mortgage-backed securities were AAA too? So why should we believe them? But uh, broader tax reforms um, have, th th there's been a discussion lately on, on broader tax reforms. We talk about them in the bullet points I've got there, the, the rates versus incentives. It's been a big issue in the United States. Um, and, and until I think people come to a consensus or a view as to what's the best way to go forward with that, um, there's, there's this whole view that everybody else is lowering their tax rates. The UK is down. Um, all the European countries are coming down. Canada's coming, well, a little bit down. 
Um, Ireland has always had a very favorable tax rate for corporations. So should we embrace something like that? Um, but at the same time, we also, even though we have a higher rate, we also have a lot more incentives. We have R&D credits. We have domestic production activity deductions. We have a number of things that are designed to encourage certain sectors of the economy instead of just a broad-based lower rate. That's been a bit of a debate, and people aren't quite sure which way to go with that. Um, we've had uh, uh, just a, a variety of things that have, that have been raised but, but not really progressed in any meaningful way. <clears throat> what has been moving forward, though, um, is the area of enforcement. Um, increased scrutiny and penalties for failure, <laughs> failure to adequately disclose. Um, I mentioned this previously, I think, in some of the seminars we've had in the past. And that is, there's, there's a very easy political argument to be made um, that, that in the sense of fairness, when it comes to reporting, uh, the government has a very good handle and, and control over the flow of information on where most activity of most middle class Americans is, right? You know, they, Paul, where is your money? Well, it's, it's at the bank. Okay, we know it's at the bank because we get reports from the bank. And, and when you earn interest income or dividend income, we get all the reports for that. Um, but, it, 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 but for those people who are uh, high net worth or just very, very savvy, they're able to route their money out of the United States through offshore vehicles and back in. And so it's been a very easy political argument to say that when it comes to reporting, um, there should be a standard that levels the playing field. And that has continued to be something that the United States has been ramping up the, um, the level of fines and penalties. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But they've continued to increase. The, the IRS has been less and less forgiving uh, on failures to adequately disclose. There was a voluntary offshore disclosure program uh, that, was, that was recently enacted. And this was interesting. With the issue of US people parking assets offshore, um, the, the, the IRS decided, along with Congress, that what, what was going to be offered was a voluntary disclosure program. And, and some of you may have heard of this. You may have had some US clients, customers come to you and talk to you about this. Um, and, and what they were offering, and, and put it in a little bit of context, the US government, the IRS, they don't like to offer these sort of amnesty programs because it encourages, the view is, it encourages people, taxpayers, to kind of roll the dice with regards to compliance, right? I, I'll hide it and I won't come forward unless I get a chance to get out of jail free. Um, so they don't really like to do that, but, but in this case, based on a number of uh, factors that are going on, including this increased scrutiny, for a variety of reasons, they decided they were going to offer this, um, this, this uh, voluntary offshore disclosure program. <coughs> Some of the key points, it allows taxpayers to avoid prosecution. That's nice. Nobody wants to go to jail. Um, what are some of the penalties, though? Even though you come forward, you won't be prosecuted criminally, but the service is reserving the right to take up to 50% of undisclosed offshore assets. It's very, very harsh. Um, what has it resulted in? Over $2 billion uh, of, of uh, penalties that the IRS has collected as a result of this voluntary <laughs> offshore uh, disclosure program. So it's been um, very rewarding for the government. Um, I'm sure $2 billion it's not enough to get S&P to raise our, our rating up, unfortunately. But nevertheless, it's not beer money. $2 billion, a lot of money. But it's also gotten a lot of um, non-compliant taxpayers to fall in line. And that's really as much the goal as anything else. Um, I put a bullet point there. Yet always neutral Switzerland. Are we at war with them now? Well, we're not really at war. I guess, I guess with regards to words and policies, we, we are. Um, there was a bit of a... a bit of an argument that went back and forth, and it, and it sort of went along these lines. Between the US and Switzerland, as between the US and many other countries, and a lot of countries that have their own treaties, there's an income tax treaty that has, as one of its provisions, an information sharing agreement. Um, and there was push by the United States to say, by the way, a lot of these voluntary offshore disclosures are coming from people who have money in Swiss bank accounts. And the argument has been put forward against the Swiss saying, under the treaty, why didn't you share this information with us? You, you, you were under a treaty obligation to share information about US people who were putting money in your, and the Swiss came back and said, no, our bank secrecy laws trump. Uh, not a good argument, I don't think. It, it's, had its, it's had its difficulties. Um, it's probably made life miserable for some executives at, at UBS and other Swiss financial institutions around the United States. Um, but, but nevertheless, it's something that's continued to be discussed between the United States and Switzerland. 
um, and it just it, it just further heightens and, and highlights as far as what the issues are associated with disclosure. Um, when we've got even friendly jurisdictions that have treaties are still in some ways assisting U.S. taxpayers by avoiding U.S. tax and by parking their assets offshore, um, it's, it's not, a, not a very good environment to be in. Um, we did have, um, and we are going to talk about an update on loss disclosures that's coming up next. And then we just threw in a couple of gentle reminders, time allowed, for a couple of forms, 8865 and wash sales, just to refresh people as to what we're looking for. So let's talk about loss disclosures. A little bit of background to our loss disclosure rules. Investment partnerships, and that includes entities that are treated as partnerships for U.S. tax purposes. For example, they check the box, a Cayman Limited Company, check the box, treated as a partnership or something like that. Investment partnerships are required to file Form 8886, a reportable transaction disclosure statement, if the gross loss in a taxable year is at least $2 million. Um, and for individuals and trusts, if they have a uh, 50K filing threshold with regard to certain foreign currency losses, I'm sorry, it says 50,000 firing threshold, which seems harsh, but no, it's a, it's a filing threshold. You won't lose your job. But um, uh, so if you, have, if you have gross losses in a taxable year of at least $2 million, or if you're an individual uh, or a trust and you have $50,000 of, of losses with regard to certain foreign currencies, then you have this uh, filing obligation. Now, I said that um, enforcement of reporting continues apace, and, and, and this, is, this is kind of the way that, just to, just to highlight for you, that, that these um, are a little bit disproportionate, but they are sledgehammers to get taxpayers to comply. For a failure to disclose a transaction that results in a foreign currency loss and certain other types of losses, for individuals, it's $10,000 per transaction. For entities, for example, partnerships, it's $50,000 per transaction. Um, when you look at a typical hedge fund, when you look at a typical investment portfolio strategy, the amount of transactions that can result in foreign exchange or other <coughs> reportable losses can be very, very large, especially in the international context when you look at most multinational funds and the amount of foreign currency transactions that are undertaken you could see that this could be an extremely costly failure to file penalty for U.S. filers. What's interesting here is that um, if you fail to file and you get hit with the penalty, you cannot claim any reasonable cause for relief. You can't say, I did my best, I relied on my advisor, et cetera, et cetera. The usual reliefs and remedies that are available for failure to comply with U.S. tax laws. Instead, the penalty is going to be rescinded at the discretion of the IRS. Um, we've been through this process on a number of these reportings. Um, it, it, is, it is literally facts and circumstances, including what kind of mood your IRS examiner is in when you request. There are formal procedures that you go through. There's still a lot that has to be done, but nevertheless, it comes down to discretion as opposed to policy or administrative reliefs that are ordinarily available, and it just complicates the picture. It just makes it more difficult. We've had successes in some areas. We've had failures in other areas. We've had a lot of compromise in areas as well. What kind of losses are we talking about that are reportable? Well, we've talked about foreign exchange losses. We're going to touch on that and stay on that a little bit more because it's a little bit more relevant. Uh, it includes losses on the sale or redemption of a partnership investment. Um, one of the keys to take away from this, though, is that offsetting gains are ignored. When we go back, I'm just going to back up for one second. When we talk about the losses, we talk about gross losses. So we're not able to offset those losses with gains to come up with a net number that gets you below the filing threshold. You can't say, I've got 60,000 of losses, I've got 20,000 of gains, therefore I'm in a net 40, therefore I don't have to file. We're looking only for gross losses. Um, most common reportable transactions for hedge funds we talked about are foreign exchange on spot contracts. Um, it, it just seems to be the nature of most international cross-border funds to have a significant amount of foreign exchange transactions because they're not only hedging specific positions, but they may be hedging baskets of positions as well. Some of the foreign exchange transactions that are excluded from the reporting requirements 
would be for, um, foreign exchange transactions that are marked to market for U.S. tax purposes. I'll give an example of that being regulated futures contracts. And cash settled um, FX, so for example, uh, foreign exchange forward contracts. So what have we seen in the past? What we've seen in the past is a fairly common disclosure that's used by hedge funds. The idea here being that taxpayers would prepare something and file it on the appropriate forms to make at least what would be referred to as a protective disclosure. And, and this is the type of language that we've seen and we've used in the past as well. Due to the nature and volume of the fund's activities, it is not practical to determine whether the applicable reporting loss thresholds are exceeded for any specific transaction or to determine with certainty whether any specific transaction has met any of the exceptions to the reporting. So in other words, we don't know what we've done. We don't know if the rules even apply. Fund is therefore reporting these transactions on a protective basis. And some of you may have, have seen this as, as a disclosure um, on perhaps uh, tax returns that have been prepared by U.S. advisors such as ourselves on the uh, Form K-1 because we have to advise not only, not only does the fund itself necessarily have to prepare these disclosures and make the appropriate filings, but the investors may have to as well. And as a result, we try to give them the best information that we have, and a lot of times this has been a common disclosure. Now, as you see from the example I gave you, there is no quantitative disclosure. It simply says there were a lot of transactions. Some of them may exceed the threshold. Some of them may even be accepted from the rules for disclosure. But we're just telling you that, I get, you know, in other words, look, I get into a whole bunch of transactions here. And if you want to come look, come look. But at least I'm telling you I do a bunch of foreign exchange transactions, either directly or indirectly through this partnership. Um, the view was that, especially with those penalties that are out there, $10,000 per transaction for individuals, $50,000 per transaction for partnerships and other entities, that at least if I make some sort of a disclosure, it's going to protect me from penalties. I've done something. I haven't just willfully neglected my responsibilities as a taxpayer. Probably the most difficult area here, though, is in the fund of fund structures. Because in a fund of fund structures, we're not getting the underlying information. Sometimes, when we're preparing a top tier partnership that is a fund of funds, from the lower tier partnerships, what we're getting is this. And we get a K-1 that says this disclosure. <coughs> And all we can do, really, as the higher tier fund of funds, is just replicate that disclosure in the hopes that, OK, maybe this will be enough so that I don't get crushed with penalties. So in late 2010, this is what we've been doing for the past couple of years. Late 2010, the IRS Office of Chief Counsel issued a memo, CCA, Chief Counsel Advice, CCA 2010-45022. The CCA states that some common disclosures made for protective purposes by hedge funds and other investment par partnerships are inadequate. In other words, they don't like this. This is not enough for them. Now, they had issued guidance in, in previous years as to what they wanted to have for protective disclosures, certain minimum thresholds. And the CCA said, we don't like it. We don't think it meets what we've already given you as guidance for the amount of disclosure that we think is required, even just for a protective disclosure. Um, and as a result of this, this guidance issued by the Office of Chief Counsel to its, to its agents and to the field, um, it, I think it's pretty well acknowledged by U.S. tax advisors that this means that both the funds and the investors are now potentially exposed to penalties. Those that use that protective disclosure maybe don't really have the protective disclosure. In other words, they're going to take whatever you filed and just set it aside and pretend as if you had never submitted anything because it doesn't meet the minimum filing thresholds. Now, um, this came out in late 2010. So for the 2010 tax filing season, it was a bit spotty as to how, how much people were able to get additional information. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in just a few minutes. Um, but just based on, on the, the, the conventions for identifying these, um, CCA, the, the number is 2010, that would indicate the year, 45, the week of the year that it was issued, and it was this 22nd issuance for that year. Well, the 45th week of the year, I think it's somewhere around mid-November, which didn't give, and, and remember, this goes to, yes, it is published, but it goes to the field, it goes to the IRS agents. It wasn't as fully absorbed, I think, by the marketplace as the 2010 filing season was being undertaken in 2011. So the CCA itself 
described how tax shelter rules apply to four hypothetical situations. Of particular interest were um, transactions in situations three and four of the CCA. The first two, not necessarily, don't worry about them. Situation three involved a top tier fund of funds, very common situation. Situation four was similar, but involved a, a reportable transaction that was not foreign exchange. And the fund in situation three used a disclosure very similar to what I showed you earlier, which was the common type of disclosure. The CCA concluded that the common disclosure used in situation three didn't satisfy the reporting requirements because it failed to describe the transaction structure, what was the, you know, what was the structure of the transaction, what was the tax treatment of the transaction, what were the potential tax benefits, and who were the parties involved in the transaction. Um, the CCA went on to reiterate earlier guidance published by the IRS saying, if you want to make a protective disclosure and avoid penalties, then these are the pieces of information that we need. And notwithstanding the fact that you were hoping for the best by providing us with whatever little information you had available, we cannot accept it because we need at least this information, says the IRS, in order to fully acknowledge that you have done the best that you can to report your, your transaction so as to avoid the penalties. Um, this CCA, clearly it's going to impact fund of funds. It's going to impact funds that are directly trading as well. Um, and what funds should assume is that there's going to be more scrutiny of reportable transactions. I think we are, the only time we are using that vague, fuzzy, protective disclosure anymore is in situations where we receive that disclosure in a fund of funds K-1. So as we're preparing a top tier, if we receive a K-1 from a lower tier partnership that has that vague and fuzzy sort of disclosure, we are using it, but I don't want to say this meanly, we're ratting out the offender. In other words, what we're making very clear is this is what we got from the lower tier fund of funds. Do I think it's sufficient? No, I don't. Um, but we're making it very clear that for this top tier fund of funds, for example, this is not our disclosure per se. This is the information that we were provided with. And you know we're naming names and we're giving taxpayer identification numbers and saying from this lower tier partnership, this is all they're giving us. Um, I don't think it's going to be sufficient though. And I think the, the takeaway, which I want to get to with um, the third bullet point, is that fund managers and administrators should be compiling data on their own trading activities and request information from lower tier funds. I think this concept of, of, of having these vague disclosures for the hope of avoiding penalties, given the CCA, and given the stepped up enforcement and activities associated with, with offshore disclosures and with certain reportable transaction disclosures, it's just the way of the world right now, um, I, think we're, we're, I think what you can expect is there'll be a lot more pushback. I think as we get further down the track for the preparation of the 2011 tax filing, which will be in 2012, I think you'll see a lot more requests from U.S. tax advisors, including us at Grand Thornton in the United States, where we will be pushing very hard saying, no, we need to have more specific information. We need these pieces of information. We need to know the transaction structure. We need to know the tax treatment, the potential tax benefits, and the identity of the parties involved. So how have we been at all comfortable reporting what we've been reporting? Um, part of it, I think, is that we understand that the information could be made available. It's just the information has not been made available in a, in a readily, um, in an easily um, managed arena. In other words, we haven't taken downloads of reports, although we know when we ask, can we get copies of the reports associated with the foreign exchange gains or losses? The answer is, well, yes, I could send it to you if you want me to send all three boxes. You know, I mean, it's just a lot of stuff there. So we know that the information is available. Um, it just hasn't necessarily been condensed in the, in the format that's been um, desired. Uh, but I think we have to start pushing back. The other thing that's caused us to get a little bit of comfort on it is if you remember there were exceptions, right? If it's marked to market as a, as, a, as a contract or if it's a cash settle. And a lot of the contracts I think that the funds get into are cash settled. Not all of them clearly. There's a lot of that are, that are closed off with other offsetting positions, et cetera. But there are enough of them that are cash settled that there's probably exceptions. And maybe we're disclosing losses associated with foreign exchange that don't really need to be um, disclosed anyway. So I, I would just, sticking with this slide for just one second, for those of you that are in the position of gathering this information, I think you need to assume that all U.S. tax advisors will be requiring from each fund this level of information. Uh, 
All right. Uh, the information that's to be compiled and requested, we're looking for reportable losses, which are $50,000 or more, on a transaction by transaction basis. <coughs> losses only. Again, we're not looking for gains because we can't net them. So if there are foreign exchange losses that are $50,000 or more, we want to know about them. A description of the, US expect, of the expected U.S. tax treatment. If you're not sure what that is, I'm sure your U.S. advisor would be happy to tell you what the expected treatment is. Um, list of potential U.S. tax benefit expected to result. Mm, if it's lost, gee, I hope I get a deduction for it. Um, the description of the transaction in sufficient detail for the IRS to understand the structure of the transaction and to identify the parties involved. Um, and exchange in interbank trades may be streamlined because you may just be able to identify that it was an interbank trade, uh, who the banks were, and just be done with it. Um, the last bullet point, which I would, I would add there too is, as part of the, the data gathering, is a description of any tax indemnification received or purchased. It's probably not something that the administrators would get involved in. Legal counsel may be aware if a taxpayer has purchased some sort of a, a tax insurance or a tax indemnity um, or has entered into some sort of tax indemnity clause. Um, it may be something that only the taxpayer would know. So it may not be something that you're made aware of. I put it there for the sake of full disclosure. But again, I think if you focus on those first four points, that's really what we're going to be looking for. How are we doing on time? Should I wrap quick? I'll wrap quick. All right, what else have we got? I'm going to touch on these very, very quickly. Form 8865. Form 8865 is used by U.S. taxpayers to report information regarding controlled non-U.S. partnerships, transfers to non-U.S. partnerships, acquisitions, dispositions, and changes in non-U.S. partnership interests. So in other words, if you're a U.S. person and you're investing in a non-U.S. partnership, you're likely going to have to file Form 8865. Um, I, I, in the interest of time, I'll just I'll cut to some of the, um, some of the more relevant points here. Um, depending on what category of filer you are for 8865 purposes, you may be required to disclose additional information. It depends, are you a controlling partnership? Are you a controlling partner? Do you have more than 10%? Have you transferred assets of a certain threshold, et cetera, et cetera? But it ranges anywhere from very simple disclosures to very comprehensive disclosures that include balance sheets, income statements, book to tax reconciliations, capital accounts, et cetera, et cetera. It could be a very comprehensive <laughs> disclosure. But it may be required, and here's the kicker, it may be required to be filed by a U.S. taxpayer even if the non-U.S. partnership files a U.S. tax return. So even if you have a Cayman fund, for example, that files a Form 1065, and we have many of them, they may not be required to, but they do it for their own purposes. But um, the Form 8865 may be required by a U.S. partner even though the form, um, even though the, the, the non-U.S. partnership files a U.S. tax return. Again, more penalties for failure to file, not good. The last thing I want to touch on very quickly, wash sales, because a lot of times this is a U.S. concept. Since we're coming up to year end, we get this question a lot from, or we ask this question a lot to administrators. We always get asked the question, what the heck is this all about? In the United States, there is a concept of wash sales which says very generally that if you have a loss from the disposition of a, of a, of a security, and within 30 days before or 30 days after the date of the sale, a 61-day period, you replace it with a substantially identical share or security, then the loss gets deferred. And so what we often ask for fund administrators as we go through return preparation is information regarding not only transaction reports but holdings reports, and it even crosses into the end of the year. So a lot of times we'll be looking for information um, that just says, here are your transactions during the month of December, for example. We know your holding reports as of December 31st. Can you give us your holding reports and transactions for January of the following year? Because what we're looking for is wash sales. So if there's loss, we have to defer it. I'll be really quick. I'll skip the rest of it. We have our disclaimer. Everything I said, you can't rely on it. And that's for my benefit. So can't argue with that. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Peter Vale. Thanks. <laughs> 